Hello and welcome to season four, episode number 10 of Conservation Conversations with BirdLife North Africa. I'm your host, Christina Hagen, coming to you live from Cape Town. So now on to tonight's main event. Uh, I, I'm sure he needs no introduction. Uh, he graces your screens quite regularly as a host of Conservation Conversation, but I'm very grateful to Andrew for stepping in at the last minute to fill in the gap in our schedule. And uh, for those who don't know, he is the AV Tourism Project Manager at BirdLife South Africa, uh, having made the move from my field, which is penguins, uh, a couple of years ago. And he's made some great strides already in, in his role, uh, particularly with the community bird guides and the exciting launch of the Go Birding platform. So Andrew, thanks very much for stepping in. And uh, I will end the poll now and we can take a look at those results. Okay, so Christina, I can't see the results. Can you maybe okay. share them with us? Yeah, I'm sharing them now. Okay, so just before we kicked off, I thought it'd be nice to know who's in the audience. Um, so 20% of you are part of the South Africa Listers Club. So let's hope to get that over 50% after the webinar tonight. Yeah. And 41%, uh, so twice as many, but still a minority of you have used the Go Burning website. So again, I think we can double that after tonight. Um, it's a phenomenal resource and you're gonna see why just now. Thanks, Christina. Um, do you mind stopping your share and I can uh, take over? Great, so. You should see that up on your screen now. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to turn my own video off so I don't distract from the presentation, but also because I am suffering from medically diagnosed man flu. Um, I was out at the uh, BirdLife South Africa Flock to the Wilderness event, and um, it seems to have hit a few people. I'm the fifth or sixth person I've heard of who's come down with a bit of a flu, um, but we couldn't leave our loyal conservation conversations listeners in the lurch uh, with the late withdrawal of our scheduled uh, participants so i've thrown something together uh, using some slides from various presentations and then with christina's last minute help <laughs> uh, finishing this off so i hope it's something that you can enjoy um, it's not something that i've been able to practice but we, we're just going to go off the cuff here um, great christina can you see everything okay can you hear me you're all good to go. Thank you very much. Okay, so my presentation tonight is on birding in South Africa. I've used as generic a title as possible. Um, and I think it's gonna end up being mostly just about the birds of South Africa. So you can sit back and relax and enjoy some, some very easily digestible content, hopefully very visually appealing as our birds are. Um, and yeah, hopefully you'll, you'll enjoy the ride with me. <laughs> so, no further ado, uh, South Africa is the envy of many countries worldwide. We have over 870 species of birds, 877 if you count the Prince Edward Islands, which I certainly do, and that takes us to about 8% of the world's global biodiversity. Um, I'm sorry if my voice cracks a little bit, I'm really uh, drinking some tea and some water in the background. <clears throat> so for for a country at the southern tip of Africa, 8% of the world's diversity is an incredible, incredible stat. Um, and as I said, we've got incredible diversity and that's, that's very much because of the range of habitats that we have in South Africa. Um, we have incredible topography right from the Drakensberg Mountains down to our coastline, and obviously our deep seas as well. Um, then we have all the habitats in between from a unique habitat or a unique whole plant kingdom like Fainbos, uh, to our grasslands, savannas, Karoo, succulent Karoo, Kalahari Desert, our Afro-Montane forests, our coasts, our wetlands, our estuaries. Um, you know, we have it all in South Africa and that means that we have, we have it all in terms of the birds as well. Um, I've obviously illustrated this slide with our national bird. Um, it's, it's a hell of a thing to have to choose one species out of 870 odd uh, to represent the country. Um, and some of you might disagree with me, but I, I think this is quite an astute choice. Uh, it's obviously a beautiful bird. Um, it's iconic. 
its its beauty is born out in its scientific name. Actually, I mean, blue crane doesn't give you too much, uh, but uh, its scientific name is uh, Paradisius, species name at least. And there's there's two theories for this. The one is that um, this bird, to the early naturalists, uh, was so beautiful that it represented the divine, like the angels, so that kind of paradise. Um, and the other theory is that they likened its uh, long, wavy, flamboyant feathers to those of the birds of paradise in Papua New Guinea, which, you know, those of you who've, who've watched the David Attenborough documentaries, and if you haven't, you must, uh, will know that they have very elaborate courtship dances, with, which make use of all of these uh, incredible plumages and feathers. Uh, and the, the blue crane does very similarly in its courtship. But even when it's standing still in a photograph like this, I think you'll agree that it is a, a very, very, uh, very, very elegant bird. Um, and it also has a lot of, uh, how can I say, cultural um, importance to many uh, South Africans. Um, for instance, in the Posa traditions, uh, the, the chief of the Posa kingdom um, or chieftain uh, has the blue crane's feather in his ceremonial crown. Um, so that's, that's how highly these birds are regarded in the, in the Posa culture. Um, yeah, so I think out of 870 species, certainly a tough choice, but uh, I think a worthy one. Further to our diversity, we also have um, an incredible number of endemic and near endemic species. Uh, endemic means that it's found nowhere else, um, and uh, near endemic then implies that it's found almost nowhere else, but uh, there is a small part of the population um, that might occur just outside of South Africa. Obviously, in South Africa, we have quite a unique uh, situation having uh, both Eswatini and Lesotho uh, within our borders, um, pretty much, apart from Eswatini, which obviously borders onto Mozambique. Um, but there's obviously a lot of overlap in terms of the Drakensberg specials um, and some of those uh, sort of northeastern specials as well. Um, so we can't say that they're, they're all truly South African endemics. A few of these also spill into Namibia, especially in the case of a lot of the Kalahari and Karoo species, those dry arid species. But uh, 69 endemic or near endemic species to one country is, is a hell of a good uh, number and a number that we can be proud of and promote um, on behalf of South Africa. Incredibly, we also have uh, two endemic or I should say near endemic uh, families. So to have endemism at the level of family, a you know, scientific family uh, is quite incredible. Um, and quite unique. So on the top row, we have the uh, rock jumpers, of course. On the left, the Cape rock jumper, and on the right, the Drakensberg rock jumper, which obviously spills into Lesotho. And then on the bottom, we have the sugarbirds, the Cape sugarbird, which is uh, restricted to the Bainbos biome, and the Gurney's sugarbird on the bottom right, which has a very weird sort of relict population uh, in Zimbabwe, in the Eastern Highlands. So. But definitely uh, the vast majority of this bird's global population is to be found within South Africa. There may also be some instances of Gurney's sugar bird uh, spilling over into Lesotho. However, if you check the Atlas Project uh, distribution maps, I think this bird is yet to be recorded for the country. So there's a, uh, a challenge for all of you Atlases out there when you uh, head off to the, the border of South Africa and Lesotho. Try and get a Gurney's sugar bird in Lesotho soil. All right, um, within those 69 endemic and near endemic species, we actually do have 20 what we can call true endemics. So I put the uh, proudly South African logo there because we can say that these are entirely our birds and no one else has a claim to them. Um, and I'm gonna run through them now and just pay a bit of homage to, to each of them as we go. And uh, as I said, I put these slides together very recently. So I'll see what anecdotes and stories and facts come up as we go through. <laughs> So the first of these, and uh, I think you'll excuse the um, uh, poor picture poor in, in, in terms of uh, resolution, but certainly not in terms of sighting, uh, is the, the Fainbos button quail. So this is a bird that uh, went through, I think, a very necessary name change. Um, its scientific name, Turnix hottentotus, uh, reflects the previous name of hottentot button quail, which was quite sensibly changed to Fainbos button quail, I think. Um, you'll see its distribution on the right hand side, all the way from the Cape Peninsula east until Makanda, formerly Grahamstown. Um, this is a bird that is endangered regionally, 
Um, I think the, the status of this bird is being um, reviewed. Um, Alan Lee, who took this photograph of one on the ground, which is honestly never how you see them. It's always flushing at your feet and taking off at a million miles an hour. Um, he, he's done a, a, a long survey of the species throughout its range, um, and I think came up with some rather promising um, statistics, but uh, certainly not out of uh, out of trouble, but maybe endangered is slightly uh, on the conservative side for the species, but a really fantastic little bird. I've been privileged to see them uh, in Agullis, um, not yet on the Cape Peninsula. I'll have to make that a goal next time I'm down, um, but certainly plenty of them out in Agullis um, while I was actually doing the surveys with Alan. The next is the Southern Black Kohan. Um, so this is the, the cousin of the Northern Black Kohan, which doesn't overlap in range, and that's from sort of the Free State northeastwards. But, but this is the Southern Black Kohan, which is largely restricted to our west coast and then um, eastwards into the Eastern Cape. Um, this is a fantastic bird, a raucous call. You can see them flying in the early mornings, um, proclaiming their territory with their very croaky um, Kor, I mean, that's where the name Korhan comes from, is that Kor sound that they make, um, which has been adopted across all the Korhans, of course. Another fantastic bird. Um, it's called the Black Busted by those who use the Clement taxonomy, um, which I think is a rather bland name. I much prefer the South African Korhan as a name. And of course, it's our bird, so we should be able to tell people what to call it, right? Um, the third one that I'm listing here is the Cape Parrot. So this was uh, recognized as a species globally as recently as 2017. It's Bird Life South Africa's Bird of the Year this year. Um, it's a, a really fantastic little parrot, very charismatic. And it has this, this very odd disjunct um, distribution. So you'll notice here on the distribution map, if you can see my cursor, is a northern population, a central population, and the southern population. So this is around the Hogsback area of the Eastern Cape. Those of you who know your Eastern Cape geography, um, this basically hugs the um, forest belt here through KZN. Uh, and then we've got this Mahubas Kluwef um, population up here. So uh, once upon a time when we had an undisturbed forest belt, these populations would have been nicely connected. Right now, there's a little bit of genetic sharing between the southern and the central populations. However, the northern population uh, seems to have been on its own for enough time that we can actually see genetic differences between the two. Certainly not enough to say that it's a different species there, but uh, um, it definitely uh, is sort of diverging from the other populations. Uh, it's endangered by all sorts of things, um, but primarily uh, loss of its habitat. So it's very uh, closely associated with forests, uh, so yellow woods in particular, real yellow wood, no tenique yellow wood, um, and they are also becoming quite well known as um, as uh, foragers in in pecan nut farms, uh, particularly in that uh, central uh, population in KZN. So um, a fantastic bird. It's our bird of the year. Head on to Bird Life South Africa's website to uh, access all the bird of the year materials and learn some more about this bird. Then it's the Neisner woodpecker. Uh, this is a, uh, I always think it looks, um, they look dirty in a way. Uh, I don't know if it's just me, but they, they're very sort of closely, densely uh, mottled faces and cheeks and that um, make me, for me, make them look a bit dirty. Not to say that that detracts at all um, from the species, um, but it, uh, yeah, it is a very charismatic bird. It sounds similar to the golden-tailed woodpecker. For those of you who stay up north and might know that call, it has a sort of nasal single note. Um, and when I was doing my MSc at the Whoop, I was lucky to see plenty of these Neisner woodpeckers um, coming in and out. And we actually discovered a couple of nest holes. So that was fun to watch these birds breeding. Excuse me. <coughs> Um, so then there's the red lock, which um, you know, I always say that <clears throat> tourists to South Africa, what possible reason could they have to visit somewhere like Achenes or Pope if it wasn't uh, for, for birding? Uh, but that's what you have to do if you uh, want to see a red lock. You'll see the distribution is concentrated up into the northwest of 
the extreme northwest of South Africa. They are associated with these red uh, dunes, um, so koa sand dunes. Um, so if you're looking for them, you need to find the habitat and then, and then try and find them. In the middle of the day, it can be very difficult. They go and hide in the shade of little bushes. Uh, but if you get there early enough, you might be able to pick them up with some ease in the right areas. Then it's the Agullus longboard lark. And, and this species has something of a sad story. Um, as you can see from its distribution, it's a true Western Cape endemic. So it's the only species that's entirely endemic to the Western Cape. Um, but there's a, a disclaimer here that uh, a paper that's going to be coming out, or I think it might even be a book uh, of the world's larks uh, is proposing a lump with the Cape long bald lark, which is the next species on the list. Um, so unfortunately, uh, despite the disagreement of many South African birders, it looks like we're going to be losing an endemic species. Um, it's going to be absorbed into another endemic. Um, this bird is, is resident on the Agullus Plains and has a very different call to the Cape long bald lark. Um, to my untrained eye, uh, has some morphological differences and also some habitat, habitat choice differences. Uh, but nevertheless, it, we are probably going to be losing it um, to a lump with this species. So um, you can certainly say that they look very similar. Um, the Cape longboard lark has the longest bill of our longboard lark. So previously, um, those of you who've been around the block might remember that we used to have one longboard lark, uh, which was then split into five, Cape longboard lark and Agullus longboard lark being two of them. Um, but this one has the longest bill. I'll go back to the Agullus longboard lark. You can see it's got a long bill, but not quite as long as this one. This one uh, is right up our west coast all the way to the Namibian border, but uh, it looks like it doesn't really get just over the border. So again, a true South African endemic, uh, but only just. And uh, birders who visit Cape Town, the closest spot that you can see this bird is on the Saldana Bay Peninsula. Um, so uh, what's that uh, little town? Paternoster to St. Lena Bay uh, tends to be a good area to see them. Then we have the Boerter's Lark, and, and this is a a truly sad story. Um, if there's a bird in South Africa that um, is most likely to go extinct in our lifetimes, I would say it's probably this bird. Um, there's a number of candidates, unfortunately, but this one is it's really on the brink. Uh, and BirdLife South Africa is trying to do something about it in the areas that we know it still occurs. Um, it's hanging on in a few spots, and it's very important for us to, to keep those spots safe uh, and also to Get the local communities involved in, in stewarding uh, these birds because they, they are under threat from um, not persecution from people but certainly the, the sports in inverted commas of, of killing birds uh, in, in rural communities uh, which can be indiscriminate. Um, this bird is, uh, many of you would have um, tried for it in Vukestrum so we have a number of community guides there who regularly are asked to see Boerter's Lark and it is becoming more and more difficult. Um, so the situation is certainly uh, quite urgent. Then there's the Rudd's Lark, which is, is heading the same direction. Um, it has a slightly wider distribution. You'll see there's some very isolated spots in the Eastern Cape where you can find it. I don't think we know very much about that population. And the, the area around Newcastle, Buckestrum is uh, possibly better known. Uh, it's, it's doing a little bit better than Boetas, but suffers a lot of the same pressures, unfortunately. Uh, so another species in our grasslands that we need to um, make sure that we are looking after so we don't lose it. <clears throat> From some of the most rare to some of the most common birds, bulbuls. Those of you who live in the Cape um, will, will know this one as your dominant form of bulbuls. Uh, the red-eyed bulbul, obviously more common in the arid interior and then dark cap bulbul uh, into the northeastern areas um, in the sort of more bushveld, if I can call it that. Uh, but I also get them uh, obviously in my garden here in Johannesburg. So uh, the Cape bulbul, um, when I used to guide clients out of Cape Town, they always used to find this bird very comical. They said it's, I made it look completely crazy, like, um, like a child had taken one of those googly eye um, 
craft type uh, things as um, yeah, those googly eyes that you stick on puppets and things and they put it on a bird, uh, which you can't really disagree with. It's kind of crazy looking, and it's white eyeing. Um, but yeah, this is a, an endemic to South Africa. Um, and then a bird that needs no introduction, a former bird of the year, uh, the Cape Rock Jumper. Um, this bird obviously extending through the mountain ranges north from Cape Town and, and eastwards as well. And uh, a fantastic fan, most endemic. The males are super striking, as you can see here. Um, also threatened, um, but only at a level of near threatened. Uh, again, Ellen Lee, uh, who I mentioned earlier with regards to the button quail, has done some seminal work on this species and, and overseen the work of Krista Oswald and others who have really mapped out this species quite nicely. So recently, we really didn't know a lot about it. its breeding, its um, feeding, etc. Uh, but luckily we've had some very dedicated researchers who worked in some pretty crazy terrain <laughs> to try and figure it out. So, uh, yeah, a really fantastic species and, and one of the most sought after by visiting birders in South Africa. Then the Nisner warbler. Um, so this is absolutely not how you normally see the species. Actually, how you normally spe see this, this species is you don't. Um, they are notorious skulkers, very uh, <clears throat> let's say not flashy on their eye, uh, very brown and, and dull. And they have a habit of um, lurking in the most dense, uh, dark, gloomy patches of forest and hedgerows and, and uh, thickets. Uh, so they have a, a wonderful cascading call, which can often be heard at the right time of year. Um, but unfortunately, a real bugger to try and see. Um, so it's one of three species that are named after Neisner. We've already had the Neisner woodpecker and the other is the Neisner taraco, which to be honest, I was quite surprised it's not considered a true South African endemic. And it turns out that the Neisner taraco moves all the way up the coastline and actually has a tiny, tiny bit of its population in Eswatini. So that ruins it as a true South African endemic. But uh, it is one of the three that's named after the little town of Neisner. I don't know if there's another town in the world that has three species named after it. If you can think of one, please pop it in the chat. I'd be fascinated to know. Excuse me for a second. <clears throat> all right, I'm battling through. I hope it's uh, all coming through OK and you can hear me. Then there's the Victorin's Warbler. It's another one of our, uh, what we call the Fainbos endemics. There's six of them. Um, we're going to cover all of them, obviously, as part of the South African um, endemics, but uh, this one is another very skulky warbler. You generally don't see them out in the open like this, but again, a very a characteristic call. Um, and if you're in the right habitat, particularly damp slopes uh, and ravines, um, then you, you, you tend to find this bird uh, by call very easily, but seeing it is another issue. Then the yellow-breasted pipit, which uh, is uh, a grassland special, uh, it's sort of patchily distributed all the way from the Eastern Cape up into uh, Mpumalanga through KZN. Um, it's, I think the most interesting thing about this bird for me is that there's a little bit of, um, should we say, hesitation about its taxonomy. So at the moment, obviously, it's regarded as a pipit, but uh, there was a rather convincing missive sent out by Hugh Chittenden, uh, not so long ago, observing that um, this bird and its structure and its habits is, is much more like a long claw. And uh, if you Google yellow-breasted puppets and you see that hind claw, it certainly is reminiscent of a long claw rather than a puppet. So uh, I wouldn't be surprised if we have a taxonomic uh, reshuffle on this particular species in the near future. Then it's one of my favorites and the poster boy for the Western Cape. Um, and I say post and boy because this is a male, uh, the Cape Sugarbird, uh, renowned for its incredibly long uh, tail in the breeding season um, and its close association with uh, Proteus. So this fantastic shot by um, Brown Holland shows that quite nicely, both features. Um, and I really talked about its uh, cousin, the Igoni Sugarbird as well. Uh, but this is definitely uh, one of the most photographed species in Cape Town, absolutely. Um, Kirstenbosch is a, 
fantastic place to go and watch these birds because they are quite nicely, um, I, want, I don't want to say domesticated, but uh, certainly habituated to uh, passers by. So you can really get some nice close up views um, if you do stop by Thurston Marsh. Another one you can see in Kirsten Bosch is the orange breasted sunbird. Um, this one is certainly the, the pretty boy of um, the Fenbos endemics, but it's beautiful orange breast and purple and blue throat. Um, and I say pretty boy because again, this is a male. Obviously in, in birds, um, the sexual dimorphism or the difference between uh, males and females often is, uh, is more pleasant uh, on the male side of things. There are a few, few exceptions to the rule, but generally males much more pretty and that's because the females uh, choose the males in most cases uh, for mating purposes arranged to some of the other species that I've mentioned so far. <coughs> then we have the Pratia canary uh, which is also one of the famous um, demics obviously closely associated with Proteas but um, a bit more patchy in its distribution and and I think definitely overlooked compared to some of its flashier uh, cousins and, and sort of co-inhabitors of the Fenbos biome. Um, it can easily be confused with both streaky-headed seed eaters and white-throated canaries. Um, so you do need to be, uh, you know, have your wits about you when you're out birding in the Fenbos and make sure you don't overlook uh, one of our very important endemics. And then the, the Cape Siskin is the last of the Fenbos endemics, and I believe the last in my 20 true endemics of South Africa. This is a very cute canary-like type of bird. Um, the photograph shows the, the white tail tips and white wing tips very well. So this is how you would um, probably most easily tell it apart from a Cape canary. Cape canaries also have a gray hood and back as opposed to um, brown, as you can see in these birds. Um, again, Kirsten Bosch is one site for them, but if you are looking for them in Cape Town, um, I would recommend Cecilia Forest, uh, just just down the hill, um, which has a resident uh, flock of them that are generally very showy. <clears throat> then South Africa also has obviously a plethora of other spectacular, important and unique birds, um, apart from our endemics. And I'll run through some of them here just in, in their groups, um, starting with the seabirds. <clears throat> Christina mentioned that I'm a former member of the Seabird Conservation Program. Um, so I would say this is in no particular order, but I do have a very special spot for seabirds in my heart. So <clears throat> on the top, we have the Arctic Tern. Um, this is the bird with the longest migration in the world from literally the Antarctic to the subantarctic and back every year. Just absolutely crazy. And I'll never fathom why birds do this, uh, but it's fantastic that we can have this long distance migrant, this world record setter uh, off of our shores during summer. Um, so often you'll see them more, more likely out at sea than uh, on land. But um, yeah, that's a fantastic species, really, really attractive when they're in their breeding plumage like this. Then on the bottom left, the uh, African penguin. You have to mention African penguin when you talk about South African birds. It's uh, a natural heritage icon and uh, also uh, a near endemic species. So there's a small population of animation is contained within South Africa. And that's our, our one native penguin. Uh, we obviously have a lot of projects and, and efforts going into conserving the species, which is doing very badly, unfortunately. Uh, our host this evening, Christina, is, is one of the penguin heroes in South Africa with her the work breeding uh, colony project. Uh, we're also working hard um, with government to, to advocate for uh, protecting uh, the fishing areas around um, penguin breeding colonies um, to make sure that they have enough food, especially during uh, their most sensitive life stages regarding breeding and, and malting. Um, but that's you know, subject for a whole nother webinar. Then <clears throat> there's the wandering albatrosses. Excuse me, just going to have another sip of tea. <coughs> Hopefully that's a bit better. Wandering albatrosses are a bit of a sneaky inclusion here because they're not on the South African mainland, although they're occasionally seen in Cape Town, but uh, they are on <coughs> Prince Edward and Marion Island and at severe threat from 
invasive house mice, which have uh, really run rampant on the island. And Burla South Africa has our, our Mastery Marion project in conjunction with the South African Department of Forestry, Fisheries and the Environment uh, to try and rectify that situation. Um, the current project budget is somewhere around 400 million Rand. So it's going to be the biggest project that Burla South Africa has ever, has ever undertaken and possibly will ever undertake. Um, <clears throat> and it certainly needs a lot of hands and a lot of effort and a lot of funds to, to get us there. But it's very, very rare in conservation that we have a silver bullet solution uh, to a conservation problem, uh, that being the decline of seabirds at Marion Island. And if we can eradicate the mice, we can save quite literally millions of seabirds every single year. Um, so hopefully that uh, goes ahead as planned in 2025. And we have some positive results for this absolute ocean wanderer, uh, fantastic birds. Just to give you an idea of how far albatrosses actually fly, um, there was a gray headed albatross which was tracked in between breeding attempts. So albatrosses generally breed every second year and they, um, track this one grey-headed albatross, it circumnavigated the globe, um, just south you know, in the southern part of the globe, uh, four times in two years, um, which is just absolutely insane. Then we have our birds of prey, and we are um, very blessed in South Africa to have a, a huge number of birds of prey. I think if you count the owls and the vultures, um, we have over 80, something like 85 species of birds of prey. Some of the, some of the most notable included here, the um, black eagle, as it was formerly known, or the rose eagle now. Um, I prefer the Afrikaans name, the Witkleis Ardent. It makes a lot of sense when you see it photographed like that on the top left. Next to that, the crowned eagle, um, our most powerful eagle. Uh, the martial eagle on the bottom left is considered our biggest eagle in terms of its dimensions, but the, the crowned eagle is heavier and more powerful. Um, then we have the uh, white-headed vulture on the middle top right. Vultures are not renowned for being pretty birds, but I think this is about as close as it gets in South Africa to a, uh, a pretty vulture, uh, but obviously very important species in the ecosystem, much maligned unfairly uh, and really doing badly. Um, I think the latest estimate of white-headed vultures was there are fewer than 250 individuals in South Africa. Uh, so that's quite a, a humbling stat. On the bottom left uh, middle is the envy of all the ladies in the audience uh, with its beautiful pink eyeshadow, the Verose Eagle Owl, the giant eagle owl as it used to be called. Top right, the peregrine falcon, the fastest moving thing on earth. Um, they can get up to 360 kilometers per hour in a hunting stoop. Um, so that's just an incredible speed for something living to be moving at. Um, below that is the Amoa falcon. It's South Africa's longest migrating raptor. And it just blows my mind that these birds, uh, which are really not very large, uh, travel from Mongolia way over to South Africa in the summer and then all the way back. And then there's the lastly, on the bottom middle right is the pygmy falcon, our smallest little raptor, which is just undeniably cute. Um, it has a fascinating uh, ecology living in sociable weaver nests. And uh, they, there's another whole lecture to be had there, obviously, on um, how these birds can live in such close proximity with birds that are occasionally prey of theirs, but also uh, actually play a facilitative role for sociable weavers by keeping other predators like snakes and mongoose away. So yeah, fascinating ecology there uh, playing out in the Kalahari. Speaking of um, arid areas, uh, these are some of South Africa's little brown jobs. We are you know, renowned worldwide for our little brown jobs. Uh, people love to hate them, especially people starting off on their birding journey. And it can be a nuisance to try and tease apart. Often the call is more useful than the, uh, than the appearance. Um, so uh, these birds that I've displayed here are all connected. Um, and apart from the fact that they're all sort of brown and dull and occur in South Africa, uh, they all have the, the name Kuru in their names. So these are all representatives of our arid interior, where a lot of our endemism um, sits. These are the Karoo Eremomala chat 
and uh, Kohan on the top row, and then the Karu Longbold Lark, Prinia, and Lark on the bottom row. These are some of the some of the flag bearers for our little brown jobs. I'm amazed that I got all those names right with my flu brain. <laughs> Then there's a whole host of other enigmatic and special birds that uh, we could mention, but I'm going to just talk about two groups very briefly, uh, those being the mouse birds firstly, uh, and then the Turaco. So mouse birds are an endemic group to Africa. You don't find mouse birds anywhere else. We have three species in South Africa, um, speckled white-backed and red-faced. And, and what makes them unique uh, is the, the fact that they they're able to persist entirely on leaf matter. So those of you who did high school biology will know that leaves don't have very much in the way of nutrition. And they're mostly cellulose and tannins. Um, so very difficult to digest and, and for very little uh, reward. But if pressed, these birds can do it. And, and the way that they manage it is they have um, special enzymes that break down plant material. And these are heat, heat activated. And that's the reason why so often when you see mouse birds, they're in this position uh, with their awkwardly sort of high up legs uh, pointing their bellies at the sun. So they use the, the sun's warmth uh, and rays to warm up their bellies, which kickstarts these enzymes and the whole digestive process. Um, and they're the only birds uh, that can actually achieve that. So obviously they will take berries and, and fruits and stuff when they can, but it's amazing that they can, they can actually persist on such uh, non nutritive diet when they have to. And then the Turacos, apart from being obviously spectacular and beautiful, um, are remarkable for um, say a more hidden reason. They have the, the, the most beautiful red pigment, um, which is called Turacin, and that is entirely unique to the Turaco family. There's no other uh, type of bird that can produce that red pigment. And the, the green pigment is, <clears throat> is Turaco verdin, which is obviously also, you can tell by the name, uh, unique to the Turacos. And uh, I think a lot of people don't realize that there are very few birds uh, in South Africa and in the world that actually produce green pigments. So there's a few examples of Turacos are one, uh, parrots are another. But uh, most birds, for example, the sunbirds, which are, you know, for the most part, quite green on their heads and backs at least, produce that green color by using blue and yellow uh, pigments and then the refraction of light to blend these together, which comes across to our eyes as, as green. Um, and that's the reason why a lot of the time when you, particularly when you're photographing sunbirds and they, they turn away from the light, they can come across as dark blue or blackish um, tinge. And that's, they lose that green sheen. And that's because the light is not passing through those feathers and to your eye. Um, so, yeah. yeah, just a fascinating little fact there about um, Turacos. So obviously, BirdLife South Africa has the mandate of South Africa's birds. And I hope that I've convinced you that we have a spectacular array of birds in South Africa. Uh, we're very um, proud of our natural heritage here at BirdLife South Africa. And we realized in... Uh, well, a few years ago, that um, there was no place for, for anyone to uh, list their South African uh, lists, as it were. So many of you, um, those of you who aren't on the South Africa Lists Club already, will probably keep a Southern Africa list. Um, the Southern African listing region uh, came about basically as a vestige of the travels of the various um, uh, naturalists, early European naturalists in particular, who, who moved through this area of Southern Africa and, and kept their catalogues uh, accordingly. Obviously the political boundaries didn't exist then. Um, and that sort of persisted then through, through their collections to various uh, field guides. And, uh, and now today, even now there's, there isn't actually uh, more than one Birds of South Africa publication that I can actually think of. Um, and the listing region has sort of carried on from that. However, it's a, a fairly arbitrary area. Um, as most people know, it's, it's the area south of the Kunene and Zambezi rivers, but unfortunately for the Mozambicans, uh, this cuts out half of their country. So it's not a, a, a very sensible region in that sense. 
And also it's not a, a politically recognized area either. So the other listing areas in Africa, be it West Africa, North Africa, East Africa, um, are, are recognized as, as political areas. Whereas Southern Africa for, um, for, for example, the UN uh, includes the likes of Angola and Malawi uh, and Zambia. So, um, so that, and obviously the Northern half of Mozambique. So it's, it's pretty odd that we as birders here in the southern tip of Africa uh, will use the sub, this arbitrary Southern Africa subregion. Now, I'm not trying to say that people shouldn't keep a Southern Africa list. Um, it does have sort of a historical basis, as le at least as I explained. And obviously people have put a lot of effort into it and it's become sort of the, the lingua franca for so South African birders in particular. But that does not exclude the, the you know, South Africa being a very worthy listing area on its own. Um, there's no reason why you wouldn't keep a list for South Africa, especially since 90% of the birds of Southern Africa are in South Africa. Um, so bird life South Africa, wanting to get people uh, excited and, and proud of South Africa's birds, set up the South Africa Listers Club. So this is a place for, for anyone who keeps a list of birds that has seen over 300 species to join up. Um, there's a very simple online form. We update the club once a week, so it's a lot more regular than some of the other regional listing clubs. And uh, we, we want to grow this as much as possible. We're over the 500 mark. We're edging towards 600 birders in the club. I'd love to push this to 1,000, so we should have you know, a couple hundred extra after this webinar. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, there's also pin badges that you can purchase from our online shop uh, for each of your milestones from 300 to 700. Um, and that is basically how we fundraise for the club. So there's no charge to be a part of. We just ask for a little bit of contribution. And recently we've also added certificates. So you know, if you want to congratulate yourself or maybe a friend who's crossed a new milestone, you can uh, order them a certificate from BirdLife South Africa as well. Um, so I hope that you will join up. It's as easy as heading to the Go Birding website, gobirding.co.za, just clicking that South Africa listers tab at the top. Um, and for those of you who aren't familiar with Go Birding, well, that's what I'm going to talk about next. So um, this was another way that uh, BirdLife South Africa has attempted to position ourselves as, um, or rather entrench ourselves as the authority on, on birds and, and birding, uh, and particularly bird conservation, of course, uh, in South Africa. So South Africa is blessed with a, a huge number of uh, books dedicated to birding in South Africa, both field guides and, and where to go birding and things, but books go out of date very quickly. Um, they're usually written by one or two people who, who can't cover all the areas. So um, we decided to take all of our, our information, uh, being birding routes, our community guides, our recommended accommodations and tour operators, our bird clubs, and put it all into one place where you can access it digitally um, and it makes sense. Uh, so we, we launched this Go Birding um, website a year ago at our, our AGM in 2022. So this month marked a year of um, Go Birding being launched. And in that time, we've had 13,500 people use the website uh, to plan their birding trips. Uh, people as far away as Sweden and Norway and the UK uh, emailed me about how they've used the information. Uh, and just before I get into exactly what's on Go Birding, um, just a, a nod to uh, some of the expert bird guides that we were able to contract in to, to do this work for us. Uh, this, this was a COVID project. Um, I took this job in tourism two weeks after level five lockdown was declared in 2020, uh, which was something of a leap of faith, but also allowed me some space to do projects like this. And um, we realized that uh, the various professional bird guides around South Africa, as well as of course our community guides, uh, we're gonna be stuck without work for some time. So we, we managed to get some, some money together through a very generous donation from Darby Chamberlain of, of Chamberlain's Hardware uh, to get this up and running. And we contracted them in to put all this information together for us. Um, they reviewed all of our birding routes um, got all this information up to the standard it needed to be, uh, and then we launched it from there. So uh, this is meant to be the one-stop shop for birding in South Africa. 
And I hope that the 60% of you that haven't used the website are logging in already to see what it's about. But I'll just take you through some screenshots um, rather than a live demonstration because you never know how things are going to behave. But this is the, the map as it stands. We have 558 pins of information. So they, the blue pins are your birding sites. There's over 400 of those. Uh, green pins are recommended accommodations. We would love to grow that network. So please let us know your favorite places to stay. Red pins are your community guides. Yellow pins are your tour operators. And black pins are your bird clubs across South Africa. And the idea is if you are a you're traveling around South Africa, say um, you're going to Cape Town for some work and you are very keen on your seabirds. Um, so Christina is hosting this tonight. So I had to choose um, something that was seabird related. Uh, firstly, you might like to see who are the local birders in the area. So you see the black pins and then you have Cape Bird Club. And as it says there, the Cape Bird Club was founded in 1948. So those of you who are very quick with your maths will know that it's their 75th uh, anniversary this year. Another reason why I chose to feature them. And if you click on that little read more button, this is what you are faced with. So all the information about the club, a bit of the history, all of the contact details, their website, their membership options and where they meet. Um, so this is a great way to find your, your local bird club. Um, <clears throat> and then if you want to go out birding, well, you know, you've probably heard of this place called Boulders Beach, which is the best place to see African penguins um, if you're in Cape Town. And so you navigate your way to Boulders Beach using the search bar. If you click on the pin, this is what will come up. Um, it will tell you a little bit about, about the beach. And then if you click uh, the click here button for more information, it takes you away to the Boulders Beach webpage, which looks something like this. It's got an about the birding section and about the birding site section. Um, it's got the key species on the right hand side, the contact details, and also a downloadable checklist. So uh, two volunteers, very clever people, um, put together this checklist based on SABAP data for every single site on the website. So you have an easily printable, tickable checklist for every site that you want to visit uh, based on the Atlas data. If you scroll down on this page, uh, you'll see the about the birding site um, section. And then the other related information section below that with all the, the entrance details, the opening hours, if there are costs involved, directions, uh, extra resources like that downloadable map, for instance. Um, yeah, and then each of these obviously has a read more tab. So what you're seeing there is just a preview. Then perhaps you're wanting to work out if you if you go to Boulders, that green pin out on the peninsula, you know, where's the closest place that BirdLife has uh, recommended you stay? And so you click on one of the green pins nearby, for instance, Avian Leisure Apartments, which are literally just up the road from Boulders Beach, mentions it there in the little teaser. Click that more information, it's a similar idea. You have all the information that you could possibly want about the accommodation as well as the contact details listed there. If you want to have a local guide, maybe consider one of the tour operators or gold pins um, and Birding Africa is the closest one there. And again, you have their profile once you click more. So each of these pins on the map, um, I showed you the sprawling map of all these different pins has its own web page. So you can appreciate <laughs> the treasure trove of information here. And then the last one I just wanted to show you was um, the red pins, our community guides. We currently don't have any in Cape Town. It's something that I'm working on and submitting proposals left, right and center to try and rectify. Haven't come up with the funding just yet, but uh, just to show you one example, Here's one of our young up and comers, Bongani Nguenya from Amans Kral, who guides around, as it says there, Dinner King, South Kales Drift, and Homo Homo. And uh, his profile looks like this. So you have his operating areas, his contact details, a little bit of a bio, and then even a, a video there linked to YouTube that you can uh, watch and get a sense of his personality before you even contact him. So Go Birding is, uh, I think, a fantastic resource as it is, but we've got some exciting future plans, potentially adding a booking facility for accommodations and guides, um, enhancing the search function. So my ideal world <laughs> um, would be that um, we would be able to search, for example, the word finfoot, if you wanted to see a finfoot, and uh, all the sites that have a finfoot on their list would remain behind on the map and you can work from there. 
um, that has a way to go before we get there. We love to integrate bird lists or other uh, bird lists in ways that we can show people, you know, when you go to a site page, here are the species that you haven't seen uh, in order of the most common. And uh, also linked onto that, having badges of achievements. You know, if you've seen all the all the barbets of South Africa, you can get your barbet badge or something like that. So um, that's where we see go birding going into the future. Um, that's all dependent on, on funds and capacity, but uh, that's our long-term vision. In the short term, we need your help to um, make this the best possible platform. We need to add more sites. There's certainly some sites missing on there uh, that other birders should know about. Um, accommodations as well, we'd love to grow our network. Um, we have about uh, 75 currently on the map, um, but we would love to grow that to over 100. So please let me know uh, your favorite places to stay and make sure that they're included on Go Birding so that others can enjoy them too. Uh, we'd love to feature any articles, there's a blog section, um, and we'd love to for you to spread the word to, to other people. So when I do uh, webinars in the future, I don't have less than half of you having used the site. I want to have 80, 90, 100%. Um, so that's up to you to spread the word and share this fantastic, free, you know, accessible resource with your birding friends. And then for you, obviously, to use the platform and where the errors or updates needed, um, please let me know. So that's it from me. Um, my voice just about held through the presentation. Um, yeah, back to you, Christina. Well, thanks very much, Andrew, for powering through. I can tell that you you aren't feeling feeling well, but thank you very much for for the the effort you put into that very um, very informative webinar. So, yeah, please uh, have something to drink while I just get the next screen sharing. And there's lots of well wishes coming in in the chat box uh, and uh, um, suggestions of of putting lemon and honey and, and whiskey in your teeth. So <laughs> um, yeah, so just quickly before we go, there are a couple of questions and then we'll let you go rest. Um, but just to say a reminder to people to please join us for our next webinar on the 13th of June, which will be about uh, hornbills and the struggles that they're facing in increasing in a increasingly hot world. Okay, so uh, first question from Penny Abbott, um, asking about splitting and lumping of species and whether it's done entirely on genetics these days and how different do the genetics have to be, uh, specifically asking um, about the Agalis longbilled lark. Yeah, so I don't think there's a hard and fast <clears throat> rule here. Um, I, I'm not a geneticist, so I don't really understand the, how much divergence there has to be for something to be considered a subspecies or to be considered a, a different species. Uh, but in the case of the Agullus longbill block, it is a, apparently a genetically based analysis and genetics are the, the hardest criterion to, to argue with. Mm. Uh, differences in morphology can very easily be masking a lot of genetic unrelatedness um, and other, you know, they, they're not able to breed because they're either separated or there's mechanical issues when they're trying to breed. So, uh, you know, they're not, they're not compatible in that way, I guess you could say. Uh, but genetics is certainly the, the, golden, the golden sort of criterion now. And that, to my knowledge, is what the Agalus Longwood Lark has been um, based on that, that lumping anyway. So yeah, it's, it's splitting and lumping is not a conspiracy of uh, bird book authors trying to sell more books that want to rest. Um, it's just a reflection of the updated science and knowledge that we have um, as we figure this all out. Um, you know, there's been crazy things that have been found totally unexpected in terms of the, the lineages of birds, rock jumpers, for instance, they are evolutionarily weird. Um, you would think they would be related to something like robin chats or thrushes or something like that. Um, they certainly resemble them, but that's a, a case of convergent evolution. And their, their closest relatives are the Picathartes or rockfowl in, in West Africa. Um, so without genetic data, we would never figure that out. 
Um, so it is fantastic, but it does cause us some, some angst along the way. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and it, it also depends on the, what areas of the genome are looked at and the various statistical techniques that are used to differentiate between um, all those areas. Uh, so there was a question earlier from Michael um, asking about the distribution maps of, of a lot of these birds that it cuts off nicely in the, in the Northern Cape, saying, do they observe borders or are uh, the maps that you showed strictly for so that? So the maps that I showed um, were from the South, Southern African Bird Atlas Project. Um, so SABAP2, for those of you who know your acronyms, um, the second version of the Atlas Project. It's not restricted to South Africa. So if there were you know, places in, in neighboring countries that they'd been seen, they'd reflect on the maps. But obviously I'd chosen to show maps of birds that are only in South Africa. Um, the second factor to be aware of obviously is that uh, the atlasing effort is largely concentrated this side of the border. So across in, in Namibia, there aren't as many people doing atlasing and, and people when they go to the border are, are generally not atlasing on the Namibian side. So we have a lot less data on that side. Um, I would encourage people to go and fill in those atlas gaps, but it might cost us a few true South African endeavors. <laughs> so maybe not um, from a selfish point of view, but uh, yeah, I think there's, Partly, partly there's a, a change in habitats, but partly also less atlasing effort and burning effort. Okay. Um, Sue, I, I'm not sure if you want to, to go here, but Sue is asking about uh, pied crows, the, the um, increase or the perceived increase in the number of crows, especially driving between Durban and Meisner, as Sue has done, um, asking whether it is of concern, the pied crows. I'm not sure if you want to answer that. It's not something you've worked on, as far as I know, but yeah, if you want to give it a stab. Um, yeah, so as Christina says, it's not something I've, I've worked on. Um, we did have a, I don't know what it was called, a pied crow symposium or something hosted by BirdLife South Africa to look at all the research. Um, and there are isolated cases where crows have, for instance, killed a whole lot of tortoises. But it seems that that is a fairly isolated behavior. So you have specific pairs of crows that start to specialize um, on those kinds of prey items. They have done really, really well with human facilitation. So things like... Um, fence line and uh, electrical infrastructure running through the Karoo has facilitated the pied crows uh, moving across the whole of South Africa and increasing in number. Uh, and they are, they are doing well in human landscapes. Um, and like I said, there is some evidence that they are uh, causing harm to other natural biodiversity, but I think generally they are uh, blamed too much for, for things going on. Uh, but again, I'm speaking under correction here. I'm not one of those people who was involved in that symposium. So I would have to look back at what they what they came up with. Yeah. Um, no, that that um, sort of tracks with what I'd what I'd heard. Um, so Kar and Josiah, who used to work for, for BirdLife South Africa and was quite involved with uh, Go Birding, asks whether there are any plans to highlight urban birding routes. That sounds like a great idea. Hey, Karen, nice to hear from you. Um, I think you're still out in the Middle East or you're back in South Africa. Uh, Karen used to be one of our interns here at Bula South Africa before moving on to other things. Um, so, yeah, I know you're passionate particularly about um, urban birds, having worked on duck ops. Um, I haven't had any plans to launch urban birding routes, but as you'll see on Go Birding, there are a lot of birding. Um, sites in urban locations. So, you know, in Cape Town, Durban, Joburg, I mean, there's lots of uh, places to bird in cities. So those are definitely included. And go birding was actually a movement away from birding routes as such. So we had birding routes on our website beforehand. Uh, those who regularly visit our website would have noticed that those have disappeared in the place of go birding now. Um, so routes, uh, are a nice way for a very localized sort of tourism focus, but 
with go birding we're trying to take this to a broad national scale so um yeah urban birding is fantastic and there's been a lot of really fascinating research on urban birds out of the uk and in uct uh, showing you know the incredible ecology that's playing out you know without anyone almost noticing um, but we haven't done anything specific on, on urban birding yet. So. Great, yeah, but it's it's good to that go birding is profiling all these these urban sites where you can go birding. I know I've used it even to look at places within Cape Town where I live. So, uh, speaking of an urban bird, do you, Ted Vermeulen, after saying no questions, <laughs> does have a question. Asked how, if you know how feral pigeons became a fake rock dove, or I think it's just a rock dove. Yeah, yeah the, <clears throat> um, yeah, it's not a cape dove, it's, um, it's now called a rock dove, and I think that is reflective of the, the original species which then spread through the world. So there are still native rock doves. I believe Spain is one of the best places to see them, um, that, that are cliff nesters and not associated with people, but they have adapted incredibly well to urban areas and have moved now almost throughout the globe. So um, it was, I think, recognizing that these are not birds that were just spawned in cities. They, they are a legitimate species that has just spread into urban areas. Uh, so reverting to the original species name. Thanks for that. I didn't, I didn't actually know that. And I'd also always wondered. Um, okay, final answer, which I'm not sure if you will know the answer. Final question, sorry. If I'm not sure if you will know the answer to from Ariane. Uh, do mouse birds also use bacteria in their digestive system or is it just enzyme? I know a lot of people were fascinated by that fact as I was when you told me uh, a couple of months ago. Yeah, um, I can't claim to be an expert on that. Um, I just know it's a fairly unknown and, and fascinating factoid. So I'm sure that there are bacteria that help in the digestive process, but I think the enzymes are the ones specific to the mouse birds, um, these particular enzymes that are heat activated. So obviously all of us have bacteria in our guts that, that aid and actually drive digestion. Um, so there will be bacteria involved, but I think it's the enzymes that are the particularly unique parts of the digestive system in mouse birds. But again, um, a quick Google or chat GPT might prove me wrong. Great. Well, thanks very much for that. And we've come to the end of the questions. And as said, Ted said, it's uh, time to let you go and rest, rest and have a hot toddy. <laughs> so thank you very, very much again for stepping in at the, the last minute and uh, putting together such an interesting uh, and uh, knowledgeable presentation. So thank you very much for that. I don't know if you have any last words before we close off. Um, join the South Africa Listers Club and use the Go Birding website. Absolutely. <laughs> um, I definitely have used the Go Birding website and it's it's great. Um, and also I'm a member of the, the Listers Club and I'd encourage everyone to, to also join that. So yeah, with those words, thank you very much again. And thank you very, very much to our audience for tuning in tonight. And please do join us again in two weeks time for another episode of Conservation Conversations. Good night.